Hey guys, welcome to The Remnant Radio. You're watching one of 19 episodes with Dr. Craig Keener, one of the preeminent Bible scholars on the planet, and we're talking about the Gospel of Mark. This is going to be an exciting episode. The connections that Dr. Keener put together while we were with him at Asbury Seminary, phenomenal. But man, it was an expensive trip to get all of us out there to film this content. But we want to give it to you for free. Well, we do want to give it to you for free, but... One of the ways that you can help offset the cost for this is by purchasing our home group material. Dawson, our researcher, has put together this material. There's a leader's guide. There is a participant's guide. So you you watch the video, you read the material, and then we walk you through. We have discussion questions that go along with it. It could be a huge blessing for you and your church. Yeah, and this would be perfect for tons of different mediums. Maybe you're a pastor uh, who's preaching through the Gospel of Mark, a home group leader, a Sunday school teacher. Uh, this would fit all of your needs. And if you want to pick this up, there's a link in the description for the home group material. In addition to that, maybe you're out there and you don't lead any kind of group like that. Uh, maybe you just want to contribute as a thank you to what we've put together here on Remnant. There's PayPal descriptions in the link of this video if you would like to uh, support us. So absolutely, click those links in the description, hit that subscribe button, and please enjoy this video with Dr. Craig here. I want to just give a, a quick summary overview of the, the story of Mark chapter 2. Jesus heals a paralytic, the story of the lowering down to the roof. There's the calling of Levi. There's the question about fasting and new wineskins and old wineskins, and then Jesus being Lord of the Sabbath. And so uh, the, the question I want to ask is, uh, what is it that thematically ties these together? Why these stories here? Yeah, obviously he could choose from a lot of things. I mean, you look at the Gospel of John, and he chooses a lot of different stories. But the theme of conflict is here. So there's increasing conflict, starting with just what the scribes are thinking in their hearts, and then climaxing in the section in chapter 3 and verse 6. It actually runs into the next chapter with some people deciding they want, they want to kill him. Um, <laughs> but along, along with that is also the theme of authority, because it's not the elite who really have the authority, but Jesus' authority is being shown throughout these passages. Uh, and, and you also have some other things. I mean, it starts with the healing narrative, paralytic let down through the roof. And then in 3, 1 to 6, you have another healing narrative. Um, and in between, a lot of the narratives actually have to do with traditions about food, with whom you eat and what you eat and what you don't eat, like fasting. Okay. So you mentioned it being about his authority, and that gets into Christology. How would mm -hmm. you say this chapter elaborates or builds uh, Christology? Well, especially because the Son of Man shows his authority on earth to forgive sins by, by healing the sick. And so we see Jesus as the Son of Man, and the scribes probably don't like him describing himself that way, especially the Son of Man with authority because those uh, terms appear together going back to Daniel chapter 7. And there, the Son of Man is one who comes to reign uh, as, you know, he's going to reign over the nations. And it's a passage in the Old Testament that seems to bring together both the divine and the human. The, the Son of Man identifies with the saints of the Most High. And I, I don't know if you want me to go into all the Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. please do. Um, what you have in Daniel 7, well, a number of times in Daniel, you have four kingdoms. But in Daniel 7, you have four kingdoms depicted as four beasts, four different kinds of animals. But then after these kingdoms, you have one that's not depicted as an animal. He's depicted instead as a human one, as a son of man. And in part of Daniel 7, like in 7, 22, uh, 23, thereabouts, uh, you have the saints of the Most High receiving the kingdom. So this is the, the kingdom, uh, God's, God's reign being given to, to God's people over, over these nations that have been oppressing them. But in 7, 13, and 14, we read about it being given to the Son of Man. So the Son of Man stands for these, uh, it stands for God's, the saints, for, for, uh, for God's people, but also... The Son of Man not only reigns, not only receives authority, but the Son of Man is worshipped. So we have a blending of, you know, here we have somebody who's like the king, like these beasts that were kings over these nations. Here we have somebody who's the king of God's people, but he's also divine. 
And so he's receiving worship. He's receiving yeah. worship. So that that is a problem, I think, for the for the scribes. Uh, they probably don't like him saying that, but they can't nail him because son of man just means human one. And then at the end of chapter two, the son of man is Lord over the Sabbath. And the way he puts it in context, even some modern scholars think that he's just talking about, well, a human being, you know, the Sabbath was made for for humans and therefore humans are Lord of the Sabbath. But that doesn't mean humans can determine what you can do on the Sabbath and what you can't. Um, Jesus is really claiming again authority as Lord of the Sabbath. Who has the right to be Lord of the Sabbath except the one who instituted it? God himself rested on the seventh day. So for Jesus to claim to be Lord of the Sabbath implies his deity. Okay, so when it comes to Christology, he's the son of man who forgives sins and heals yes. in the story of the paralytic. He's the son of man who's the Lord of the Sabbath at the yeah. end. We also have Jesus as friend of sinners hanging out with Levi. I'm interested in that. And we also have Jesus in the passage referring to himself as a bridegroom. Hmm. So can you expand upon these pictures, uh, what we learn about Christology in, the, in between the middle stories of the passage? Yeah. Now, the friend of the bridegroom could be an Old Testament allusion, too, because, of course, Yahweh was the, um, the bridegroom of his people. So that's not as explicit. And, and also, when Jesus uh, talks about the bridegroom being taken away from them, you're getting your first foreshadowings of what's going to be the teaching about the cross. But it's not explicit. Nobody can nail him on it, mm -hmm. but it's, it's pointing in that direction. As far as the friend of sinners, um, Jewish tradition welcomes repentance, but it did not it did not emphasize going after the sinner or seeking the sinner. So Jesus is actually violating some Jewish traditions there. Since the second century BC, there was an increasing emphasis on ritual purity uh, that ended up for the dividing of the temple in in further uh, compartments like what will come up when we get to Mark eleven fifteen? You also have uh, people using stone water jars like you have in John 2, 6, so that people, um, th those were the jars made of stone were the ones that were considered not to uh, contract ritual impurity. And then you have the, the arguments about ritual purity in Mark chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. You have a tradition about that. To eat with people who are ritually impure, ritual impurity was considered very contagious. But even the Old Testament, before all this emphasis on, on contagious ritual impurity for laity, I mean, it already was there for priests. Even in the Old Testament, Proverbs 13, 21 or so, um, Psalm 1, 1, you're not supposed to hang out with sinners, but it's it's, you're not supposed to hang out with sinners to be influenced by them. But in Jesus' case, the influence is going the other way. And we, we saw that just in the last chapter, too, with the, the mm -hmm. cleansing of the leper mm -hmm. uh, and, and also his authority when it came to teaching as well and then mm -hmm. casting out a demon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well, on that, how does, uh, how does chapter 1 flow into chapter 2? We were introduced uh, to the gospel of the Son of God, so Christology right out of the gate. Uh, uh, how does how does the flow of chapter one how, how does how does chapter two build on chapter one maybe put it that way purity considerations are already there <clears throat> so the cleansing of the leper um, and and actually Jesus having authority over impure or unclean spirits people are concerned about him in terms of purity but he's actually dealing with the real the thing purity is really about you know curing actual impurity, driving out impure spirits, um, for which some of the other stuff may have been symbolism. And then also they said, wow, he really has authority, not like the scribes. Hmm. So you have this, this contrast already in chapter one in the synagogue. You get to chapter two and you've got these scribes sitting there in front of him. Obviously they get the best seats. You know, Even if they came in later, people would make the way for them because they're prestigious, it's an honor based society <clears throat> but Jesus knows what's in their hearts and they're saying you know this man blasphemes 
But we're going to find out in chapter 3, in terms of blaspheming against Jesus and blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, and then in chapter 14, he's going to be accused of blasphemy, and they're going to, uh, chapter 15, the, the same Greek word, which can just mean speaking against sometimes, they're blaspheming against Jesus on the cross. Um, it, it's, it's, it's showing you who's, who's really blaspheming and who's really speaking the truth. And so it's kind of flipping everything upside down. Um, at least everybody's perception of things is certainly going to be flipped upside down, especially at the cross. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so right off at the beginning of the, the chapter, he heals the man who's, who's lame, but he forgives him of his sin. Yes. How do those two things even correlate? And, and why, does, why does Jesus choose to do that instead of just heal the man, unlike uh, Elijah or one of the, I mean, because this isn't the first time healings have happened by a prophet. Mm -hmm. First things first, the, the forgiveness matters more. Now, Jesus doesn't do that very often. I mean, he, he, he forgives sins, obviously, but he doesn't uh, connect them very often. But the idea was often connected in Jewish tradition and actually among Gentiles as well, where it was thought often, they didn't always say this, but that sickness was punishment for sin. Um, Jesus doesn't say that specifically, but he does deal with first things first. And it is, it is also interesting you know, the scribes are the ones who think this in their hearts against him, that he shouldn't be saying that. In, in antiquity, most surviving sources are from elites. They're the ones who wrote the stuff um, and could afford to circulate what they wrote. And they usually portray the masses as, as easily misled Cursed, and, cursed rabble. Yeah, Book of John. Yeah. yeah, and and and, but it wasn't. It wasn't just the rabbis. I mean, it was it was a widespread view among elites, and they usually viewed, um, you know, elite elite teachers as is smarter and you know guiding people in the right ways, and then these populist demagogues who had the crowds following them. Well, Jesus is popular with the crowds, but these people with this elite attitude right from the start, they're not getting along with Jesus. And he's not catering to them. He's catering to the people who have needs. And these people who came, came to him, it says when Jesus saw their faith in chapter 2, I think it's verse 5, he saw their faith. It's, it's not based on anybody's status. It's based on their faith, which is demonstrated by their desperation to get to Jesus. You know, everybody wants to hear Jesus. The scribes have the front row seats. But these, these other people are so desperate. They, they know if they can just get their friend to Jesus. Because who else is, I mean, if you, if you don't really believe Jesus is going to do it, you're not going to tear up your neighbor's roof uh -huh. trying to get to him. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a, a question about when, when he, he saw their faith. Mm -hmm. It makes sense to me, like, he sees their faith and therefore he heals this man that that the faith context makes a difference he didn't do many miracles in nazareth because the, the faith environment mm -hmm. mattered but that the forgiveness piece i'm just assuming that the man must be in the pronoun there their faith because could he really forgive the man on the basis of somebody else's faith how do you interpret that yeah, probably it's it's in the there. We do have um, other cases of Jesus healing people based on their faith or based on somebody else's faith. So the idea of intercession is mm -hmm. is also there. The friends brought him. Um, so five thirty four, he says to the woman who who reached out and touched him, she was desperate too. Faith faith is often demonstrated in desperate acts in this gospel. Um, you know, bumping up against people in the crowd. She's ritually impure. She's not supposed to be doing that. She's not supposed to be touching the hem of his robe, but she touches him anyway. Um, so it says in 534, your faith has saved you, go in peace, which he also says to uh, Bartimaeus in, what is it, 1052 or thereabouts. But in, in 536, he says to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe. And there he's interceding for his daughter who has just died. 
So it's not her faith in that case. And so a number of times, and, and in chapter 9, obviously, it's a case of intercession with the father, with his, with his son, and Jesus saying all things are possible for those who believe, and inviting him to, to trust him. Um, as far as the language of salvation is used a number of times in the gospel, usually for healing, but it can also be like Jesus hanging on the cross, let him save himself. Uh, he saved others, let him save himself. He healed others, let him save himself or rescue himself from this. So it has broader connotations. So faith is related to salvation in, in, uh, in broader ways that I think intersects with, with Pauline theology. But on that basis, I'd also think that, yeah, the guy would have to have his own faith to be, to well, be I mean, saved. I, the, the audacity of them to tear through somebody else's roof uh, I mean that that's clearly desperation. Yeah. Um, and to to make a big show in front of those who were teachers in the law, uh, and then Jesus just makes it all the worse by forgiving the man of his sin in front of mm -hmm. all of them, and then performs the healing. Yeah. Uh, you had told us in conversation earlier about the amount of time you spent in your commentary, um, or amount of time of research you spent on uh, architecture at that time to make sense of how they could tear through the roof. Explain that a little bit. Why? Why so much yeah. time there? Yeah, most most houses had like an outside staircase. Sometimes there was a ladder. That would be really hard for them to navigate carrying this man. But most of them had an outside staircase, often built of stone. Once you get to the roof, the roof was flat, and it was people did all sorts of things on the roof. They they uh, sometimes they'd take their lunch on the roof. You know, sometimes they'd sleep on the roof. Uh, they they would uh, do textile production on the roof or whatever. Uh, it was, uh, well, yeah, in the Old Testament, you see people storing vegetables on the roof. You see uh, people talking to their neighbors in the New Testament across the roof or uh, Peter going up there to pray on the roof. So roofs were in common use. Uh, they would have a parapet around them. Uh, of course, that's Deuteronomy 22, so your neighbor Nobody doesn't fall off, off and break their neck. <clears throat> but... The way most roofs in Galilee were built, including the uh, including roofs that we know of in Capernaum, where where the scene seems to take place, you would have beams across the the uh, the covered part of the home. the The courtyard actually counted this part of the home, and and they could get into the courtyard, but there were too many people for them to get into the house. So they could come in the outer gate into the courtyard. A lot of people could be crowded there. Uh, the whole of the town may be hyperbole, but you could cram a lot of people in, and hundreds of people maybe if you have them packed, packed really tight. But up on the roof to try to get to Jesus, okay, they can maybe look in over people's shoulders, see about where Jesus is, probably toward the back of the room. They get up there. Th there are beams across the roof. You wouldn't be able to tear those up. But then across those were laid branches and... Um, I just assume straw or something. Yeah. That's always and then, envisioned and in straw, my head. Straw atop that, and then uh, mud that would be caked down and, and flattened. So you could dig up the, the, the mud from it, and then you could tear up the branches. You know, some stuff would fall on the people below, but, you know, especially if you get the mud layer <laughs> yeah, off got first. Me wondering. Yeah, on the scribes. <laughs> yes, up. on the scribes. And so, uh, but you can lower the person between the beams. And, and with how far apart they were, either. They can, they can let the guy uh, down, uh, I guess, I don't know how to describe it, this way on the beams, uh, between the beams. Or if his shoulders are too wide, which may or may not be the case, but if the shoulders are too wide, they could, they could flip him sideways or flip him upside down <laughs> and get him there as long as he was tied to, to his, uh, his See, This would have been quite a scene. It would have been quite a scene, yes. Wow. And also, I mean, that always gets overlooked whenever I'm just reading the gospel. I don't yeah. think about all of the work that goes into lowering a man who's paralyzed and then tearing up and a roof. The audacity to destroy someone's roof. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, but they, they have insurance, every, you know? No, yeah. <laughs> every, every couple of years, they'd have to redo the roof anyway. Because remember, it's mostly mud kicked yeah, over so, it. And every year, they'd actually have to 
um, to level it again and, and so on. But every couple of years, they I, have I to, just love just to redo it. imagining the conversations that they were having. Like, it's okay, just tear up the roof. This is more important. It, 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 it's old mud, you know. <laughs> but he, he needs to redo this. And we're, and we're doing him a favor. Often neighbors contributed to to building the home anyway. Friends and neighbors, so they'll help each other I mean, out. It's it's going to be understood. You tear up the roof, you're going to help fix it later. And they saw that as worth it, causing this yeah. kind of scene to get their friend. Yeah. Which I mean, there's a lot of application. What is you know what faith looks yeah, like? Exactly. I mean, you you can think of what does it look like for even us with our friends who are sick. Yes. Uh, how do we intercede on their behalf? Yes. Um, Sorry. Can, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd like to, to move from, we talked about the paralytic. We talked a little bit about Jesus friend of sinners and the purity implications there. And now that flows into the story about fasting. And uh, we touched on the bridegroom piece in Christology, but I think there's some more gold for us to mine out of that portion of the story. The setup for it is Jesus is being questioned by the people because John fasts and his disciples do, the Pharisees do. So Jesus stands out as different. And so they have this question, why do you not fast, but they do? And he, and he has this bridegroom example. It sounded as though you see that is Old Testament background there, and uh, maybe not. Okay, I saw you shake your head. Well, oh, yeah, yeah, the bridegroom part. I was thinking of the fasting. That's not the fasting yeah, part. The, the fasting, you've got one biblically prescribed fast, but you had a whole bunch of other ones that have been added since then. And so Jesus actually doesn't go along with all the extra biblical traditions. Okay, uh, maybe, maybe you could Tell expand us, yeah. it. What's the biblically prescribed fast? I think of... Old Testament, Daniel's fast, or maybe Isaiah 58 is what you're thinking of. And nope. is this well, the fast yeah, that I... Isaiah 58 is, uh, yeah, is spiritual kind of People in trouble for right? fasting the wrong ways. <laughs> yeah, but no, I was I was speaking of Yom Kippur, the, the Day okay. of Atonement, uh, Leviticus 16. And yeah, so that's the required fast uh, that everybody was supposed to do. Um, but... And Jewish tradition would make exceptions for like pregnant women and, and certain other kinds of, of situations. But uh, then there were other fasts that were added, and at least during the dry season, many Pharisees fasted um, twice a week. When you mm -hmm. say dry season, you mean of the month, of the, of the uh, year? Of the year, yeah. <laughs> so that's just like, you know, there's just not a lot of food right now, so let's just fast <laughs> and dedicate it to like, God. I was like, maybe he means like, you know, the voice of God was rare in those days. It was a dry <laughs> so season. <laughs> but no, actually, um, yeah, I'm, I'm taking the minimalist approach. Some people think they actually fasted two days a week all year long. But yeah. Okay, so, um, so he's differentiating. He doesn't keep the traditional fast. So it's continuing that theme of Jesus had feels no need to keep these extra biblical traditions. Uh, and, and then he introduces... The bridegroom theme, and he uses this this next metaphor is about wine, which is I'm supposing possibly related to weddings because that's what feeds into it. And uh, so he talks about wine, new wine, new wine skins. Help us understand what he's talking about, and and maybe what he's not talking about because I I hear this sometimes in, in my circles, or I, I I hear about friends in their churches where pastor stands up and he casts vision and he says, you know, the old wine skin was this, but God's doing a new thing. Don't you want the new wine? Don't you want the new wine? Support our building fund because God has a new wine skin. Was Jesus talking about building funds here? <laughs> or church vision? Uh, church, or... Was he talking about church visions? Uh, uh, was he talking about something eschatological? Help us understand what this <clears throat> means. The new wine may actually be related to like uh, Mark fourteen twenty five, where Jesus says, "I'll drink, I'll drink uh, the fruit of the vine with you, anew in the kingdom." So it's the idea of the messianic banquet, uh, which also is a wedding banquet in a sense. But <clears throat> wine, when it ferments, it expands. So if you have wine skins, they, they would be like goat skins or sheep skins uh, after the animals died. You would you would make use of their skin. You know, before then you could make use of their their hair. Uh, you could make use of their milk. But once they die, you've got the goat skin, and if it's old, it's already been expanded by by wine 
that expands in it. But it, it's already stretched to the limit. You put new wine in it and it expands, poof, it's going to burst the, the wine skin. The same when you put a new patch on an old garment. You know, the old, the old garment uh, has already shrunk as much as it's going to, but then the, the, the new patch, when it shrinks, it's going gonna, it's gonna to just rend it and make it worse. And that language of rending is also used for the rending of the temple curtain. It's used for the, uh, the high priest rending his robe. So it's something dramatic that, that is coming. Because, like this new teaching with authority in chapter 1, when the Son of Man comes in, I mean, it's not the fullness, it's not the consummation of the kingdom, but it's really going to rock some people. Okay, so the, the new wine is the kingdom. It's messianic. It's the messianic banquet. I had not made the Mark 14 connection b before, so it's really like Jesus, because he'll talk about being taken away, so it's the kingdom is visiting you right now, but partially, <laughs> because the consummation and the full messianic banquet is to come. Is, it, is that? Yeah, I think there's already not yet imagery. A lot whereas, of whereas the, the old wine skin would be the law and the prophets, or the old old way of doing things. I mean, Jesus is not against the law. Uh, of course, Matthew really emphasizes that. But I think in Mark too, we don't see Jesus violating the Torah. We see him violating. The additional traditions yeah which comes out big in mark chapter so, so is that sort of the old then that he's referring to i i think so uh, that one don't hold me to it my commentary might change on that but that's what i'm thinking right now gotcha um well so then the next thing is the accusation on the sabbath mm -hmm. what do you make of that did jesus observe the sabbath yeah i think jesus observed the the sabbath in terms of scripture but again, there were a lot of additional things that were added in terms of interpretation and how far you push these things. As far as his disciples going through the grain field on the Sabbath, uh, we see Jesus valuing people's hunger more than he values human tradition. So including on the issue of fasting, uh, not, not saying, I'm not speaking against fasting. Uh, Jesus fasted. We know um, the early church fasted. So it's not against fasting. But he really takes human hunger seriously. And we see that again. His disciples are going through the grain fields on the Sabbath. Um, they, um, yeah, they're going through the grain fields on the Sabbath and they're plucking heads of grain, which they were allowed to do. Uh, that's called gleaning. There's a whole tractate in the Mishnah about, about gleaning. Uh, pe uh, um, and you've also got that in the Old Testament a number of times where you leave things the poor can, well, actually, the gleaning from the edge of the field is one, and then the, from the trees you have um, anybody going through the field is allowed to take something. But the problem is it's on the Sabbath. And the plucking they might overlook, but to be able to eat the grain, the grain that you just pluck right away, it's normally not very easy to eat. You're going to have to grind it somehow whether in your hands or you know, between your teeth or something, to be able to get it edible. I mean, they're really hungry if they're, if they're doing this. But To me, it's like eating crawfish. It's just too much work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and the, the, the Pharisees who find them, you know, the people often ask, what are the Pharisees doing in the field on the Sabbath? Well, it may not be that far outside of town, but... The, uh, so it may not be beyond the Sabbath day's journey, or they may be spying, because remember, he's already got some enemies. Mm -hmm. And so things are building up, and they're, and they're looking for reasons to accuse him. And so earlier they said to the disciples, why does your teacher eat with sinners? Well, now they say to Jesus, why do your disciples do this? I mean, they're, they're coming at it every way to, to see if they can nail him on something. And he makes a comparison with David, perhaps because he's the son of David. Uh, others say, well, no, it's just a, just a comparison. But either way, um, the high priest was willing to make an exception to ritual law on account of hunger, or at least what David claimed to be hunger. I mean, he claimed he had a whole bunch of people with him. We don't know if that was actually true or not, but Jesus had a whole bunch of people really with him. And so um, 
hunger can override that because the Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. And that's why you have people being created in the sixth day and the Sabbath on the seventh day. Uh, so it invites people to rest. Now, in the Makilta, uh, an early rabbinic source, uh, reporting traditions mainly from the 200s or so, but in the Makilta, it says the Sabbath was made for people. Hmm. And so technically the Pharisees should have agreed with him. But there were two schools of Pharisees. There were the Shamaites and the Hillelites. The Shamaites were the stricter school, and they were the dominant school in Jesus' day. And they may have been the ones with whom he had the most run-ins. The Hillelites were a lot more laid back. Sometimes for Jesus, like on the divorce issue, they were too laid back. But, um, and then Jesus climaxes by saying he's Lord of the Sabbath. And so you can see why they're looking for an occasion to kill him <laughs> in the next uh, in the next paragraph, because he keeps saying things that are tantalizingly close to revealing his secret identity, but not close enough to nail him for sure in a court, especially if you have some of those more lenient Pharisees who were known for being lenient and not executing people on charges if you didn't have absolute proof. So um, anyway, the tension is building. <laughs> so, so Jesus... He, he eats with tax collectors. He doesn't fast like the Pharisees do. He keeps the Sabbath in a different way. Is he just, is he just one of those people who's trying to press buttons? Well, it seems like it, Mark is at least trying to press buttons <laughs> uh, and using those stories. Right. So w what's, what's happening here? You've talked about how the tension is building. Is Jesus anti-institutional? Is he against traditions? I know he kept some traditions, such as... Hanukkah. Yep. <laughs> so uh, John ten twenty two. Right. So w is he anti institutional? Is he just rebelling against the system, or is he trying to show? Is this really a Christology thing? Is he trying to nail home? I'm Lord of the Sabbath. I think of the very beginning of of, of this uh, passage and forgiveness, uh, w where he is. It, to show that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. Is he really just trying to prove the point? I have this authority. Like, what is going on? Often when he goes after them, it's they're the ones who bring the stuff up, like in Mark 7 for sure. But, you know, even even in in Mark 2, it's the thoughts that are in their hearts that to which he's responding there. And it's not like he wanted to make a scene. Somebody else dug through the roof. You know, he mm -hmm. could have he could have healed the man in private, but they couldn't get to him in private. So you know, he, he does he does what he needs to do. But after a while, it's like, yeah, he's being provocative, uh, but but not so much that he's going to go to the cross prematurely. He's still got to prepare his disciples. So there's still a messianic secret, but it's it's like not completely. Um, so he's, he's, he's just barely provoking them, provoking them just enough yeah. to do two things, point out their mistake, also show his messiahship, his deity, uh, Sure, but not is. enough to go to the cross just yeah. yet. Now, yeah. now, you skip the tax collectors part. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because Le Levi is a tax collector. And uh, in Galilee, Rome didn't tax directly. That was under the authority of the Tetrarch, under Herod Antipas. So the money went into his coffers. He could send money to Rome. But um, there, were, there were different kinds of taxes but people obviously didn't like tax collectors. I mean, even even in Egypt, where we have the most documentation for tax tax collectors, because the dry climate, a lot of documents survived. Sometimes tax collectors were so severe that if they couldn't find somebody who owed the money, they would <clears throat> they would beat up his his mother to find out where he was, and. There are records, tax records, that show that entire villages would sometimes skip town when they heard a tax collector was coming and go start a village somewhere else because yeah. they couldn't afford to pay their taxes. So wow. this is heavy stuff, you know. And also, we actually have a tax receipt from from Egypt where just this this huge exorbitant amount, and the receipt says for extortion. You know, I mean, it's like. Uh, they, they 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 were not well liked they for were, for a so number. And they were bad cheap. dudes. They, they were intentionally. Yeah. And, 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 and yet, all of his friends gather 
as well. They all come to the party as well. And Jesus is eating with these people to, to reach them for the gospel. You know, in, in Capernaum, Capernaum would have been on a, on a customs route. There, were, there was a lot of trade going through there. Uh, it was a fairly small charge at each custom station. But after you get through enough custom stations, you know, you're going to double the price, you're going <laughs> to triple the price, whatever. You're just going to be raising the prices. So um, local municipalities got a lot of that money, but also um, the fishing industry. So local fishermen would get enough not just to live on, subsistence fishing, but those who were using nets would be using them to gather enough fish that they could sell the fish. Places like uh, Magdala, where Mary Magdalene was from, had a fish packing industry. They would salt fish, uh, dry, dry fish, salt fish, and then export it, sometimes to not only elsewhere in Galilee, but all over the place. But there would be taxes on that. And so imagine you've got um, this tax collector and these tax collectors following Jesus now. You can imagine how uh, Simon Peter... It's got to be unnerving and, for everybody. Yeah, it's going to be, for the four fishermen, this is going to be a little stressful, probably. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, Craig, thank you so much uh, for sharing with us. So there's Mark chapter two. Stay tuned for Mark chapter three. I hope you've enjoyed that episode on the Gospel of Mark with Dr. Craig Keener. If you want to go back and watch former episodes that we've done, there's a playlist right here, uh, or you can watch the very next chapter, which will be listed right here. If you've been blessed by this episode or other episodes we've done, consider giving. There are links in the description. <laughs> <laughs>